Welcome to the Doc Talks Podcast, a conversation on what's new and relevant in the world of Canadian medicine and hospital healthcare. I'm your host, Ian Gillespie, and I'm here to ask the questions and find the answers you need to know. We want to help our listeners know how to prevent and detect illness and how to navigate our healthcare system. Be sure to subscribe to the Doc Talks podcast to stay up to date on new episodes and follow us on Twitter at St. Joseph's London or visit sjhc.london.on.ca slash podcast. Hello, I'm Ian Gillespie, and welcome to the Doc Talks podcast brought to you by St. Joseph's Healthcare London. You know what they say, the radius connected to the scaphoid, the scaphoid's connected to the trapezoid. I'm sorry, I'd like to apologize for that. I, you're probably wondering why am I singing? I'm not sure, but what am I singing about? I'm singing about bones, bones that are all part of a seemingly simple part of the body that's actually quite complex. I'm talking about the wrist. And today, I'm joined by Dr. Ruby Graywall, an orthopedic surgeon from Roth McFarlane Hand and Upper Limb Centre at St. Joseph's Healthcare London, and we're going to learn a bit more about the wrist and its common injuries and conditions. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Graywall. Oh, thanks, Ian. It's nice to meet you. <laughs> so I think a lot of us might be familiar with things like repetitive stress and carpal tunnel syndrome, which I've dealt with, people who work on keyboards and so forth. That's not an uncommon thing. But I wanted to ask sort of at the outset here, are wrist injuries common? Well, here at St. Joe's, we have what we call the hand and upper limb center. So we're a tertiary unit. So we only look look at arm injuries. So for us and in our group, wrist injuries are very common. And we're a catchment area for almost the entire western half of the province. So most complex injuries will come to us and also just the regular run of the mill. Someone just fell and onto their outstretched hand as well. Right. I should specify that I guess there are sudden injuries like a, a fracture or a sprain right from a fall. And then there are more sort of long term problems like some of the ones I was mentioning their repetitive stress, arthritis, and carpal tunnel. Let's start with the injuries like falls and strains and fractures. Can we talk a little bit about that? So this, I would assume this would be commonly from what? People slipping on the ice or engaging yeah, I mean, in a sports activity? Or? Anytime you fall as a reflex, our first gut instinct is to throw our hands out to protect ourselves. So sure. typically for young, healthy patients, they will injure their wrists when they're playing sports or doing activities like that. And unfortunately, as we get older and our bone quality diminishes, sometimes just a fall even from standing height is enough to break your bones. Oh, wow. So that sort of injury, I guess, how is that sort of treated? I mean, a fracture, would, is, is that usually a splint or is it surgery? It would depend, I guess, on the severity, right? Depends on the severity. I'd say the vast majority can be treated with a cast and just a bit of downtime in the cast while your body does its thing and heals the bones. But in some cases, if the injury is a bit more severe or the bones can't quite be put back into position appropriately with only casting, then we need to do something a bit more invasive and that's when we get involved with surgery. And then what about the long-term problems that we see, repetitive stress syndrome and carpal tunnel? Can, can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, is that something that we're seeing more of recently in the last decade or so, do you think? I think we probably are seeing more of it in general as a population. We're becoming more sedentary. We're becoming mm. more dependent on keyboards and smartphones. And people are doing a lot of repetitive thumb use, a lot of repetitive and sustained posturing when they're sitting on their keyboard for eight hours a day. And I think that certainly does contribute. And what kind of symptoms uh, would someone experience who's experiencing something like that, like carpal tunnel syndrome? Well, carpal tunnel, what that actually is, it's the carpal tunnel is the name that's given to the bones, the shape that the bones form around the wrist. And that is a particular point where the nerve can get pinched. So when the nerve gets pinched, it's a feeling very similar to that when your foot falls asleep, when you're getting pins and needles, burning, tingling pain that sometimes wakes you up from sleep and sometimes causes so much numbness in your fingers that people lose dexterity. They lose their fine touch. Sometimes when they're grasping onto things because they don't have that sensory feedback, they often don't know how tight to grip things. So little things will even just slip right from their fingers. And what's what are the sort of treatment options for someone who's 
having that sort of problem. During the day, if you were to get into a funny position like that, that's pinching your nerve, we would shake it off or we'd move or we would do something. The problem comes at night when you get your wrist into a bent position and you could potentially be like that for six, eight hours at a time. And that causes severe compression on the nerve. And that's why people will wake from sleep because of it. So one of the easiest things you can do is to just get any kind of a splint just from the drugstore or anything off the counter Something that will keep your wrist bent backwards away from that flexed position. And by keeping your wrist in that position at night while you're sleeping, for one, it'll prevent that nerve from getting kinked. I always explain to patients, it's sort of like a garden hose, right? If you have a garden hose that's bent, that kink is going to inhibit water flowing through. And even if you undo that bend, the kink is still there. So if you can wear a splint quite regularly at night, that'll hopefully prevent compression and hopefully over time act to kind of allow that kink to work itself out. I've experienced that. There was a period where I was waking up and my my hands were asleep. So in that case, I mean, should people wear a splint on both wrists or is it normally just one? I would say just whichever one is bothering you. And it's not that cumbersome if you're doing it at night when you're sleeping. Um, You don't necessarily have to do it during the day, but nighttime splinting is the first line treatment for carpal tunnel. And I'd say for most cases, it can really make a big difference. Wow. And then, sorry, is that something though that it's a fairly simple treatment, I guess? I mean, Well, that would be our first line treatment. And that works, I think, for people when they have fairly early disease, mild symptoms, that could be potentially enough to reverse it. But unfortunately, as the disease progresses, and the nerve gets quite badly pinched, that's not going to be enough. I think it probably still helps. But oftentimes, once the pinch has been on for a long time, then people often require surgery. And what we do is we basically increase the amount of space in there so the nerve doesn't get pinched so easily. How frequent is surgery then used as an intervention? Is that uncommon or is that done a lot? It's fairly common. It works very well and it doesn't necessarily have a lot of downtime associated with it. So I think it's a pretty common surgery that we do for this problem. Right. And the recovery process is fairly quick? In terms of the initial recovery, it's just related to the wound healing. And once the wound is healed, the stitches are out, you can use your hand. The carpal tunnel is that area. It's just right around the heel of your hand. So that's an area that people often put a lot of pressure on and they're gripping and things like that. So certain people, if they have heavier jobs or more manual type work, then their recovery would be a bit longer. So it's a bit dependent on the type of activities you're doing. And then as far as people who suffer pain from keyboarding for long hours during the day, maybe you can talk a little bit about the importance of an ergonomic desk setup, right? Is that that the key there? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's very important to make sure your keyboard and your workstation is set up for you. We saw a huge increase in the amount of repetitive strain activities when people shifted to working from home because they may have had a nice desk set up at work. But now all of a sudden you've got people working on their kitchen table and their dining room table and things like that. So we saw certainly saw a huge increase in those types of injuries and problems. So I think, you know, making sure your screen is at the right height, your keyboard is at mm-hmm. the right position. There are a lot of different types of keyboards that are out there now too, a split keyboard. Some people use mm-hmm. a vertical mouse instead of the typical mouse. And these adaptations, I think, have been really helpful for people. A big thing, though, aside from the setup, is to just remember to take breaks during the day. For some people with repetitive strain injuries, we'll often tell them to put a little timer on their phone or on their desktop so that every two hours they get a little reminder so they can just stop and do a 30-second stretch break. And that, that really helps to just break it up and hopefully be a bit more preventative. And then what about other conditions like, for instance, osteoarthritis? Now, is that something that would affect mainly older patients or? Yeah, osteoarthritis is a name that we give to the wear and tear arthritis. So the arthritis that happens over time as the cartilage that coats the bony surfaces wears thin. And now instead of having two smooth surfaces gliding against each other, you've got bone on bone. That's similar to a repetitive sort of stress injury? 
typically when we talk about repetitive strain injuries, we're talking about more of the soft tissues, the tendons, the muscles, things like tennis elbow, the tendons basically getting injured. The arthritis actually affects the bones that make up the joint itself. So when the cartilage coating on the surface of the bone wears out and you've got bone grinding on bone, that's what we call arthritis. And again, this is mainly in older patients? Typically in older patients, but we'll also see it after injuries. So if somebody has a injury that's gone into the joint and injured the cartilage of the joint itself, they will be more prone to developing arthritis. Unfortunately, we still don't have a way of regenerating or recreating that cartilage. So you see those two groups predominantly affected. Oh, okay. And is there a way to prevent the onset of something like osteoarthritis? There are certain things that will predispose people to certain types of arthritis. It's basically wear and tear over time. So the harder we are on our joints, the more they will tend to wear out. You know, for example, knee arthritis, the heavier you are, the more quickly your knees will wear out. So weight control is a big thing for preventing osteoarthritis in the knees. The hand, it's a little Mm -hmm. bit harder because a lot of it has to do with the type of work people do, the type of activity. We see particularly Mm -hmm. in women, a lot of wear and tear arthritis at the base of their thumb. And that's just from years of a lot of pinching and gripping and sustained activities that involve that, that causes that to happen. There's lots of different theories about it. A lot of it has to do with hormonal changes causing a little more laxity in their ligaments. And then because the ligaments are a little bit looser, the joint moves a little bit more and then it can cause a bit more wear and tear. And then are there other conditions here? I've got in my notes, rheumatoid arthritis. Is that How is that somewhat different? So where osteoarthritis is a wear and tear over time, rheumatoid arthritis typically affects younger patients. And rheumatoid arthritis is what we call an inflammatory arthritis. So what that means is the body itself is generating inflammation, almost attacking the joints and the lining around the joints. Hmm. How is that treated? That's if you've heard of the specialists called rheumatologists. Rheumatologists do a lot of work with people with rheumatoid arthritis. And once you get a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, I'd say the first line treatment is medical management. So there are a lot of medications that can help to reduce the inflammation that is being generated in your body. And I'd say for most patients with rheumatoid arthritis, they need some type of medical management of it. And we've had a lot of advances over the years and the the drugs that can help help treat rheumatoid arthritis have gotten really good. Unfortunately, though, it can attack certain joints. And when it attacks certain joints, they get into the same issue with the cartilage worn out and pain, stiffness, and particularly in the hand, there are significant deformities that can develop for people with rheumatoid arthritis. And it sounds like, so then is this an instance where we haven't really talked about wrist replacement? Is that? Yeah. So as the joints get attacked and get damaged, eventually Mm -hmm. it will be beyond salvage. And the medical management is just not enough. And if the pain is bad enough that it's affecting people's day-to-day life, it's affecting their quality of life, then that's when we usually intervene as surgeons. And we'll focus in on whichever joint is is bothering them. And for rheumatoid arthritis, it can be their fingers or it can be their wrist. And wrist replacements are one of the things that we're offering now to these patients, which is providing them with really exceptional benefits. I'm not sure I understand what a wrist replacement is. So are you replacing certain Muscles or bones or? Yeah, so a joint replacement typically replaces the bone, the ball and socket, so to speak. So you typically will have on one side a ball and the other side the socket. So those are usually made of metal. And then there's a connecting piece, usually a type of high density plastic, sort of a polyethylene type of insert that helps to connect those two pieces. Previously, 
the only real option we had for people with really bad wrist arthritis, with rheumatoid arthritis and, and osteoarthritis for that matter, was to fuse the wrist. And, you know, the basic thought was, well, if the bones hurt when they're grinding on each other, let's stop them from grinding on each other which means we stop them from moving, which works great for getting rid of their pain. But then people have a wrist that doesn't bend up and down, which people learn to make do if their pain is bad enough. But the nice thing about the wrist replacement is it not only gives them the pain relief, but also lets them keep their movement. So that's been a real game changer for for that population. How how long have have you been doing wrist replacements at the hand and upper limb clinic there? Is that, again, is it a relatively recent development or? It's a relatively recent development. And historically, there have been wrist replacements. They will sort of come up into favor and then they say, well, the long-term results are not great. And then they'll fall out of favor. Mm -hmm. But in general, I would say the generation of wrist replacements we have now are really quite good. And we've been using them for, I'd say, about seven years, five to seven years with really good results. And we typically try to offer them to patients that initially are not going to overuse their wrists. So the rheumatoid population is an excellent one. And that's sort of where we've started. But we're moving into more of the general wear and tear arthritis as well. Right. What about Prevention. I mean, you've talked about a kind of a variety of, of problems that can affect the wrist. I mean, is one thing, one preventive strategy, strengthening the bones in the wrist? Is that something that a person can do? Particularly with the thumb arthritis I was talking about that often affects women, there are hand exercises that you can do to help strengthen the muscles and hopefully help stabilize the joint a little bit more to help lessen the symptoms or slow down the onset. And are there any sort of supplements? Like I, I think I've heard of, say, calcium pills or something like that. Is, is that helpful to, again, prevent fractures and injuries? Well, yeah. So in general, for bone density and bone health, calcium and vitamin D are very important. And those are really the building blocks. As people get older, they tend to lose bone density. So one of the most important things you can do is make sure that you're getting a lot of calcium and vitamin D. And it is thought that dietary calcium is better for you than calcium supplements. So that's, you know, drink your milk, eat your cheese. Okay. (laughs) I love cheese. And then what about, I mean... For many people, I mean, if we go back to the injuries, the, the fractures and the sprains, I guess part of that is preventing a fall. Uh, right. So certainly the weather plays a huge role in that in this part of the world with icy sidewalks yeah. and snow banks and things like that. So we do see a lot of wrist fractures and wrist injuries in the winter months. Good footwear is really important too. You know, I had a patient recently who was said, you know, she just for a minute slipped on her husband's shoes and ran out into the yard to do something quickly and down she went, right? So good supportive shoes are very important. Being a little bit extra cautious when you're on uneven ground or slippery surfaces. In the winter months, people that do like to do a lot of walking, there are spikes that you can put on the bottom of your shoes that help give you a little more traction. And those have been shown to be quite helpful. For prevention, you know, Mm -hmm. we've been interested really in looking at osteoporosis and looking at wrist fractures and how that plays into it. Because oftentimes people will fall and break their wrist when they're younger and active, you know, and by that, I mean, the 50 year old, 60 year old, when an elderly person falls, once they're in their 70s and 80s, then you're looking more into hip fractures and more serious injuries. So the wrist fracture is really a very good early warning sign to start thinking about bone density, and to start thinking about your overall bone health. So we have a program here where if somebody does present with an injury such as a wrist fracture from a simple fall from standing height, we will start the process of osteoporosis screening. Because if we can identify somebody early that may be headed in that path, intervening now when they're 50 or 60 will make a big difference 10 or 15 years down the road. And just being aware of like what we talked about, calcium supplementation, vitamin D, regular bone density checks so that you know if you're sort of falling on that slippery slope. Because although wrist fracture is bad and can really affect people's quality of life, what we really want to do is prevent that hip fracture, which could potentially put somebody into a nursing home. Wow. 
Okay. This is probably the dumbest question I, I can ask, but I don't know. Just because we're talking about falls, is there a strategy to fall? Like you said right off the bat, and people instinctively reach their hand out when they're falling. Is there a <laughs> is there another way to fall? Should people try not to reach forward when they fall? I, well, I think really that's funny. a reflex. And, you know, that's a reflex right. that has developed for a reason, because you want to protect your vital organs, you want to protect your brain. And unfortunately, I think as we get older, and we lose those reflexes, is when people fall and break their hips, and they fall and they hit their head and things like that. So, you know, it's, it's there for us to help us and protect us. And unfortunately, I think it happens in just that split second moment that there's not often much opportunity to, to change the trajectory. Are there any specific supports at St. Joseph's at the hand and upper limb clinic now in place for, for people who have experienced risk problems and conditions? Yeah, we're actually very fortunate to have a world-class therapy department in our hospital under the same roof. So they have been really integral in helping our patients achieve great outcomes. And we're very closely connected and patients often will see us and then go straight upstairs and see the hand therapist and they can see them right after they see us. Um, so we really have an integrated model where we're working together because the surgery is really only half of it. The a big part of it is the hand therapy that goes into it to really making sure that people get back their full function. Well, drink your milk then, right? <laughs> Along with the other things. And correctly place your keyboard and there's lots of other interesting strategies we've learned today thank you thanks dr graywall for joining us today on the doc talks podcast thank you for having me that's it for this episode of the doc talks podcast thanks for joining us and join us next time when we'll continue our conversation on what's new and relevant in the world of canadian medicine and hospital health care be sure to subscribe And follow us on Facebook and Twitter at St. Joseph's London. Or visit sjhc.london.on.ca slash podcast. Until then, stay healthy. Stay healthy.